Good morning, everyone. Please welcome to the stage the chairman of the Milken Institute, Mike Milken. Good morning, and um, I couldn't be more excited about the group we have here today. Uh, they cover the entire spectrum of healthcare, medical research, uh, and the perspectives they bring, whether it's from a philanthropic standpoint, government standpoint, patient care standpoint, will <clears throat> not only enlighten us, but give us a view of the present, but the future. And I'd like to start with Sue Desmond Hellman, who runs the Gates Foundation. Now, Sue was front and center on the AIDS epidemic in Africa and spent a couple years working on that. She then went to Genentech, probably the most successful biotech company in the world, and her septin uh, was one of the advances that occurred in Avastin, and it changed the world for everyone that had diseases related to those areas and continues to. Then she went and became the chancellor of one of the great academic <coughs> medical institutions in the world, UCSF, for a number of years. And then the calling of the opportunity to go to the Gates Foundation. To give you a measure of the Gates Foundation, its budget is very similar to the National Cancer Institute, not too different from the FDA, and the decision and the flexibility that it offered. Sue, what was the excitement that made you give up that unbelievable opportunity at UCSF as chancellor uh, to go to Gates? Well, uh, thanks, Mike, and, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I, I will tell you it was an excruciating decision uh, to leave UCSF. Uh, at one point in time, and, and I think this will resonate for Mike, who crams more into any one day than anyone I know, I had convinced myself I could do both jobs. Uh, but when I uh, realized that was uh, as crazy as it sounds, um, I went to Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation because there were two moments in my career that drove my um, decision that, that I, I think is Im, uh, implicit in the introduction you just gave me. One was moving from my medical training at UCSF um, during the AIDS epidemic and being an oncologist then and literally seeing all my patients who had Kaposi sarcoma, the cancer that AIDS patients often presented with, all of my patients died, and they died quickly, and they were my age. So that sense that I had of how precious health was, how precious life is, and how important it was to work on things that made a difference was top of mind for me. Um, but the other experience that I had had was the one I had at Genentech, where I worked for 14 years and literally saw the power of science and technology in my case, having moved from taking care of HIV-infected cancer patients to many, many women with breast cancer, and seeing how much just a single moment in time, the launch of Herceptin, the first targeted therapy for breast cancer, in many ways changed everything. So what I loved about Bill and Melinda and Warren's dream at Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was their ambition their ambition to do what I had seen done, which is to take the power of science and technology and the compassion that they bring every day to the work we do uh, and drive a better future. Um, so I love the scale and the ambition. Um, and, and maybe that's where I'll start with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is the ambition. Um, this session is all about thinking about how everyone deserves a healthy and productive life. Um, if you care about humanity, that sounds obvious. But what if you care about economic prosperity? A lot of this conference is about economic prosperity. There's a lot of people who care deeply about financial health and fiscal health. And I think that's terrific. I think everyone deserves a healthy and productive life. So where we start at Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is looking at, at the history of how countries have emerged to allow 
their citizens, the people who live in these countries, to have that chance at prosperity. So if you think about the time between 1990 and 2015, almost inarguably, that period of time was one where more people than ever before in humanity lifted themselves out of poverty. That's a tremendous accomplishment and one that we think about a lot at the Gates Foundation. So I actually have some slides. So in the 90s, China me meant more people than ever came out of poverty. In the 2000s, that was India. So the prosperity that we see in the world today, a fair amount of that was driven by gains in China and in gains in India. Now look at Africa, look at Sub-Saharan Africa, and this is both a promise, but if we're not careful, a peril. If you think by the year 2050 that there'll be 500 million additional population added in Africa, the question for all of us is what will life be like for those 500 million? The projected population growth is, is quite striking. So the promise is that youth bulge. The promise is youth who are thriving, learning, growing, contributing. It's not uncommon that when I travel in Sub-Saharan Africa with Bill Gates, he makes the comment, which I agree with, probably somewhere in the audience in Addis Ababa is the next Bill Gates. Why in Nigeria won't they be likely to produce someone who will drive the future for all of us from a technology and innovation standpoint? Well, what about that population growth in Sub-Saharan Africa? One of our core beliefs at Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is that all women should have the right to decide when she has her first child, at what age, and how she spaces her children. So we believe that population growth should be driven with women having decision rights and access to contraception. If you look at the human capital side of that increase in population. What's shown on this slide is the GDP growth projections in Sub-Saharan Africa very clearly depend on investments in health and education. So what we're betting on, we're betting on the future. We're betting on that future occurring in an outsized way in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we're betting specifically on those future citizens of the globe being healthy, productive citizens. So let me end by mentioning one of the best bets we've ever made at Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. If you look post-World War II, there's been very few global organizations, global efforts, where everyone in the globe has gotten together to do something important. Since 1999, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has spent about $10 billion, 10 billion with a B dollars, <clears throat> nearly one out of five of every dollar we've spent on three entities. One, Gavi, the Global Vaccine Alliance. Two, the Global Fund to eradicate HIV, TB, and malaria. And three, the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. Those three entities in 20 years, $10 billion, have allowed a return on that investment that's 20 to 1. We love that kind of leverage. And more importantly, everyone who's come together in the world to drive those three entities has contributed to the kind of progress we've seen that have brought down under five mortality from 12 million deaths in 1990 to half that, six million deaths, by 2015. Those three entities will continue to make a great contribution, particularly in the areas of vaccine preventable diseases, but also control of HIV, TB, and malaria, to our goal of decreasing further by half to less than three million under five deaths by the year 2030. Now that's the kind of leverage that I love to see. Thank you, Sue. and. Uh... I want to follow up just briefly on a couple points you made. Number one, the increase in life expectancy in Africa. 
So the projections show us that almost all the net increase in the world's population will be in sub-Sahara Africa. And I think the issues that Sue was raising, uh, part of life is quality life, healthy life, and in certain parts of sub-Saharan Africa, we're going to see a doubling of the life expectancy in one generation. And as we've discussed many times over the years, maybe the greatest achievement by mankind, womankind, humankind, has been the extension of life. And in four million years of evolution, we extended average life expectancy from 20 to 31, which was average life expectancy in 1900. Today on the planet, it approaches the mid 1970s, 72, 73, more than a 40% increase in 120 years. And just thinking about what's occurred as this is being brought, led by the Gates Foundation and Sue's efforts uh, to those parts of the world today. The second point I'd like to highlight is the issue of best bets. We constantly point out that government's investment in public health, sanitation, uh, and medical research and care is probably the highest rate of return on any investment that you can make. But also, it's interesting when we talk about Herceptin that Sue talked about, uh, Denny Slayman was one of our young scientists in the early 80s, and one of the things we have found in our work is the highest rate of return that we've received over the last 40 years has been in supporting young scientists, generally in the early to mid-30s. The third point I want to talk about is relating to women uh, and the opportunities in the world today, many of them backed by the Gates Foundation in education and health care, and the dramatic change in growth. And it is estimated that if we had full inclusion by women that the GDP of the entire world would increase by $30 trillion. So, Sue, I think you've touched on many of those most important points. Taking care of a patient. So we have a group that spends their time in laboratories and working on this, but ultimately it's patient care at an individual level. And Bernard, you've taken on unbelievable responsibility over the years to care just in the United States for more than 13 million people who look to Kaiser. We talk about healthcare costs, we talk about access today. With modern technology, how is Kaiser changing to bring down the access issue, to bring down the cost issue, and, and adapting to this at the patient delivery level? Yeah, uh, good morning to everyone, and good morning, and uh, it's a real honor to be here and spend some time on this critically important topic. You know, maybe bridging from that last slide that you showed, which is really good news in terms of the progress, as you said, that we've made, where a person now in the 1900s was living to about 31 and now... 31 average life expectancy in the world and about 50 in the U.S. Yeah, and, and now you look at uh, anywhere from 72 to about 85 in that range now of a, a normal life that you would expect and would hope for. Um, of course, I'm shooting for over 100, so we're working. Well, it working is, as that. you know, it, it varies by countries, and many countries are in the, in the mid to late 80s. But Bernard Tyson, I, I have a feeling that God here will grant you life to 100, the fact that you have taken such good care of 13 million I, people. <laughs> I talk to him every morning. And... <laughs> we wondered what was the success of Kaiser. Well, one of the challenges that uh, we all have in the great progress that we are making is this word called affordability. Uh, it's a word that historically has been used in the healthcare industry, but more for lip service. Because we used to debate in the healthcare industry, do you want quality service or affordability? 
And the narrative used to be, if you're going after affordability, you potentially would damage quality. Um, we've never bought into that thinking. Uh, our Permanente Medical Group physicians at Kaiser Permanente has historically looked at what's the most efficient, effective, evidence-based way of providing care and how do you continue to scale it where you're taking care of individuals uh, and populations. In the world that we exist in today, um, the question of affordability is centerpiece to everything that we are doing. Uh, and it's coming from all walks of life, uh, interacting with Kaiser Permanente and in our country, and I would argue uh, in the world. And the way that I look at it is, I, um, for the sake of this discussion this morning, you need to think about affordability on two levels, uh, what we call the affordability of coverage <clears throat> and the affordability of care. And I would say over the last 10 to 15 years in terms of a range, the narrative has been much more on the equation of the affordability of coverage. And as a result of that, uh, there are products that have been created in which you can spread the risk, uh, if you will, between the major purchaser, whether that's the employer uh, or the government being the two biggest, and then what gets spread on the backs of the American people. And that formula has been changing dramatically over the last uh, 10 plus years, where the average person has assumed more and more of the financial risk associated with the care that's really needed. And so you end up with what some would call an affordability package for coverage. Uh, but then you discover when you need care you then discover what those $5,000 deductibles really mean and the $500 co-pays and all the things that then comes into play from the economics of it. We've maintained a focus on both parts of this because of our unique model in which we provide the coverage <clears throat> and the care. The reason why the coverage is important in our country at least is because I describe it as it serves as the key to the front door of the American healthcare system. We, in reality, have already said that we guarantee health care when you need it. Uh, but if you don't have coverage, uh, historically, the way you got care was when you got sick enough and you were willing to go into the health system, you ended up going through one of the most expensive doors in the system called the emergency department you tended to suffer longer, and the recovery process was more expensive. And so what could have cost, for the sake of this discussion, $1,000 to take care of you upstream uh, when you were showing the flu symptoms, when you were having breathing problems, et cetera, most people, when you have the key to the front door called insurance, you readily go and use those resources in a more proactive way. When you don't, historically, you wait and try to wait it out, and then the next thing you know, you end up in the emergency department, and what could have cost $1,000 to recover you from is now 10 to 20 to $30,000 through the medical episode to recoup you. And so we look at both those dimensions in terms of where we are, the affordability of coverage and the affordability of care. The focus now is on how do we create more affordability of care? And that is a combination of things that I know we're gonna talk about. The advancement of technology and how helpful it has been in enabling our physicians and others to practice more effectively, more efficiently, and to provide more convenience to our members. And so what used to be the only real access point of care which was in the doctor's office, the physical visit, now is being replaced by all kinds of opportunities to get access to care 
without stepping a foot into the doctor's office. We have invested in a whole infrastructure of technology that allows our members to have virtual visits. Uh, that could be done by telephone. That could be done on video conferencing. Uh, that could be done in individual settings and group settings. Uh, we leverage technology to become more efficient as an organization. Uh, we look at in our hospitals how to use technologies for things from our logistics, the most efficient use of moving patients around so we can have a most efficient system to oversight and making sure, as we call it, a third eye to monitor our patients when they're in our hospitals. All of that leads to more effective, efficient care, supporting the physicians and the caregivers who ultimately make the healthcare decisions to be more efficient and effective and then more affordable. And then the last part I would say <clears throat> is that there are two ways that we look at the economics of it. One is, um, what are we doing uh, and investing in as a large health system that ultimately allows us to rebase our costs. So there's a very different economic buildup to a technology platform than it is from building a hospital and all the things associated with a hospital setting. Uh, and that is paying big time dividends as you start to think about it. The fact that we do and are headed towards the majority of our uh, hip surgeries our physicians are doing are same day surgeries. Uh, when I first started in the healthcare field, you, that, that was something you didn't even think about, right? Uh, when I first joined Kaiser Permanente, I helped to open the open heart unit in San Francisco. We used to calculate after heart surgery, you were going to be in the uh, cardiovascular uh, intensive care unit on average of 10 to 13 days when we first started. You could go from 7 to 10 to 13 days. Uh, now you can have open heart surgery. In fact, in some cases, you don't have the invasive surgery anymore. You could go in for a 24-hour procedure and you back out and live in a productive life. Major advancements, advancements in moving it forward that we're all benefiting from. But at the end of the day, the question that most people have on their minds uh, is this issue of the cost and who's going to pay. So, Bernard, I think you've raised uh, a couple issues I want to comment on. First... Uh, it is shocking when we think about it, but a very large percent of Americans, 40, 50 percent, cannot come up with $500 in a medical emergency. So how these costs, what these co-pays, as you've pointed out, are extremely important. Second, I just cite I had the honor of serving on a commission for Governor Brown here, uh, which completed last November. And when it began, we were the personalized Medicine Commission. Nine months later, we changed our name to the Precision Medicine Commission because we could sequence your microbiome and all these, uh, not just your DNA or your disease, and therefore we were precise. And when we submitted the report at the 22 month, we changed our name in the report to the Precision Health. And I think one of the points that Bernard was made, it's a lot easier if we can focus on preventing a disease and the shift at Kaiser and its focus uh, that we can identify if we can shift the not getting the disease instead of treating it or dealing with it at an early stage. Well, uh, Seema, you are to many people in our country today uh, ground zero on the focus of healthcare costs. You are the largest payer uh, of all healthcare costs in the world. And a lot of responsibilities go to CMS. So I'd like to, uh, not everyone is familiar uh, with CMS. I'd like you just to describe it, its responsibilities. And I'd also maybe like you to touch base on what is your background that today uh, has you leading CMS. And how is CMS, for example, helping to bend the health care cost curve? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be at this conference. Um, to start with, the CMS is the, the nation's largest insurer. We insure about 130 million people across the Medicare program, the Medicaid program, and the Affordable Care Act exchanges. 
Um, so we have a large responsibility. Um, we're about $1.3 trillion of almost a third of the federal budget. So our focus, from my perspective, isn't just paying the bills, but to use our, our large footprint for the entire healthcare system to drive change and to drive affordability across the entire system. Um, we want to focus on how do we make sure we provide accessible, affordable, high-quality coverage for all Americans. And in order to do that, we need to focus on uh, providing more efficient health care so that it can be affordable and accessible to everybody. Um, so I look at that as sort of our main and central focus. I come at it from a background in public health. Um, I started my career on the front lines working on HIV AIDS policy and maternal and child health and working in a public hospital. And I think that was a great vantage point um, for being on the front lines of healthcare, not just looking at sort of the challenges that um, a provider system goes through in terms of running a hospital, running health clinics, um, but also the perspective of many of our uninsured patients and the challenges that they're dealing with. It's not just about what goes on in the healthcare setting and giving somebody a script or setting a broken bone, that there are so many complex issues around healthcare um, that go beyond what happens in the healthcare setting. So I've spent my entire life focusing on coverage for individuals, spent my my time uh, developing a consulting company that worked with a lot of state governments, with Medicaid programs, departments of insurance. And I felt like it gave me a really good vantage point um, to understand the healthcare system. And so when the opportunity came to work at CMS, I jumped at the challenge. Um, I am a, a daughter of immigrants and um, really appreciate what the country has done for me and felt like it was my, uh, an opportunity for me to give back to the, to the United States in terms of public service. Uh, I think that healthcare is, you know, we're talking about challenges, we can talk about innovation, technology, and so many aspects, but because it's such a large part of our economy, um, that the future of America also is our ability to how we are addressing healthcare, and it has such a large impact. So I'll start with some of the things that we are doing at CMS. We have many initiatives, but I'll, I'll start with sort of our role in terms of focusing on driving healthcare costs down, and, and I'm going to talk about innovation. Um, this is where I feel like the government cannot be a barrier to innovation, and our job is to unleash innovation. And some of the things that, you know, in terms of our policies, if we don't get it right, sometimes we can thwart innovation. If we don't get our payment policies right, where we're not paying adequately for new innovation, then sometimes we stymie investment. If we take too long to approve new drugs and new treatments, that can also contribute. And then there are just government policies that, um, that are not supporting innovation. One great area that, that Bernard mentioned is in the area of technology and remote communication and telemedicine. So this has been going on in the private sector for many years, but ironically, Medicare would not pay for it. Medicare would only pay for telehealth in rural settings. And so after a lot of review of our regulations, just this past year, uh, the administration started paying for what we call remote communication technology. We can't pay for telehealth, but we can pay for remote communication technology. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's always a challenge of government policy. So, you know, that's, a, that's sort of a, a great example of how sometimes government can be way behind and the advent of technology and, and using telehealth and Skype and talking to your doctor and emailing, all of those things can be so important to addressing health. The other area that we've been very focused on is in the area of healthcare records and interoperability. And before I launch into all the policy discussions, I always tell this story, so I apologize to the people that have heard me say this before, but I think it sort of sums up the issue. Um, I, my husband had a, a cardiac event while he was traveling, and I was in another city, and the paramedics called me, and they said, do you have, you know, what's his healthcare background, what's his history? And it was such an unexpected event, I didn't have that information. He spent a week in the hospital. We had all kinds of tests 
that went on. And when, when he left, I said, well, I need uh, all of his health information, I need the records, and we go back home, I can give this to his doctors. And folks looked at me like I was nuts that I was asking for his health care record. And what I essentially got was five sheets of paper and a CD-ROM. And that really spoke to me in terms of where we are in our healthcare system in terms of efficiency and interoperability. And so that's why we've been focusing at CMS around the issue of interoperability and patients having access to their healthcare records. Um, I envision a world where we have a healthcare record that starts from the time a baby is born, collecting every single healthcare event, interaction with the healthcare system, and even potentially, um, you know, our genetic background, um, wearable technology, all in a complete medical record. And what that can mean for us as patients in terms of having all of that information um, to understand our health better, to predict illness, to be able to prevent illness, a massive step forward. For providers in the healthcare system, if you're a physician, to be able to have your patient's complete medical history is going to be able to fine-tune diagnostics. We're going to prevent unnecessary healthcare services, repeat testing. And then probably the most significant area is what this means for research and what it means for technology and innovation and new treatments. You know, it's kind of thinking about examples of when the polio vaccine came about and they were doing the trials for that. And they were sitting there recording all of the patient outcomes by hand on a piece of paper. And now imagine all these clinical trials going on and to be able to have this complete medical record. And we are now living in an advent of artificial intelligence where we can take all this vast reams of data and make sense of it. And so it sort of gives rise to an era of precision medicine where we understand what treatments are going to be the most effective for each individual. And we're giving them those treatments, not trying a bunch of things that are not working. So really giving rise to evidence-based treatment. So that's why we've been focusing so much on unleashing data. At the agency, for the first time, we've made available not just our Medicare uh, data uh, for our basic population, but now Medicare Advantage. So for the first time, the agency is now making available to researchers a complete set of Medicare data. And later on this year, we will be adding the Medicaid population as well. So again, we're trying to contribute to innovation by making all of this data um, available to the community. The other thing that we've done, because just us unleashing data isn't quite enough, one of the things that we did about a year ago is we made available claims data to patients. And you might think, well, what? it's not the actual medical record, it's claims data. But claims data can tell us a lot about a patient's history, what medications they're taking, what physicians they've seen, what services. And it can actually give us a lot of information. And the information was available to our uh, clients and to our patients. But nobody was using it because, of course, who would want reams and reams of data on claims data doesn't mean anything. So having data available doesn't mean anything unless it's understandable to the patient. And so we started to put uh, the data available and called our Blue Button 2.0 project and putting the data available, making it available in an API format, which is essentially allowing innovators to take all of this data and to make sense of it for our beneficiaries. So within the first year, we've had about 1,800 app developers that are engaging in the sandbox, being able to take this data and make it meaningful for patients. And some of the examples are things like allowing patients to match them up with clinical trials and studies that are going on so that they can donate their data to these researchers. Or it's helping them select health plans that may be, or you know, particular drug benefit that they may be best suited to them, or allowing them to take their medical history and give it to their doctor and to organize that data. So we feel like this is the beginning of what I'm trying, calling the, the, the digital data revolution by having all this data available and unleashing it. It's something that the, the White House under the Office of Innovation that has been behind as well, because we sort of see this turning point in terms of unleashing that data and making it available. And that's sort of the contribution that the government is making towards supporting that. Um, so that's innovation on the, the data and digital uh, information. 
being available. The other thing that we're trying to focus on in terms of innovation is how we pay for healthcare. I mean, one of the strongest levers we have is our, is our checkbook and how we pay for care. And right now, our system is set up to just pay for sick care. Um, we pay for the more doctors and the more physicians do and uh, providers do, the more that we pay them. And so we're trying to think about how we reverse that trend and paying providers to keep people healthy. A great example is, is how we do this is in our Medicare Advantage program where we're contracting with private insurers uh, like Kaiser, and, and Bernard's here to talk about that, where we can say, here's a defined amount of dollars. And so it creates a financial incentive for the insurer to keep that person healthy and to make those investments in technology um, to compete for patients on the basis of quality and cost. And so we've done that in one section of our program, but we're trying to bring that concept of value and providing the appropriate financial incentives to payment to create a system that focuses on keeping people healthy, providing high quality care at a lower cost. So Seema, first, I think we want to make sure people have taken away. You are running the largest company in the world. Uh, at 1.3 trillion, it's more than twice the size of the next largest company in terms of revenue. Two, as it relates to the United States, you are taking care of more people directly or indirectly and their lives and their health care than anyone in the world, 130 million people and probably increasing. And we can't thank you enough for taking this job. You are also ground zero on the discussion of our budget, where we're going and how we're going to control. And I think what we heard here is the movement, which we'll learn, we'll discuss in a little more, more detail, of the movement to a digital record, patient having access to record, AI and technology analyzing, and a moving to prevention uh, rather than just dealing with the patient after. Most of the expenditures in the healthcare system by far today are treating someone that's sick. But today, the ability to sequence your microbiome and your genome and your disease, uh, by sequencing your body, we can tell what you're highly likely to have as we focus on this and what role the change in weight in America has played as we estimated just the change in weight over the last 25 years cost the United States $1.4 trillion. And so this ability that you have with this data to look historically uh, should have an enormous benefit. And we uh, are excited that you're in the position to take us in to the 21st century, now in a government agency. Francis, you've had a pretty exciting life. You know, you, you were designated to lead the Human Genome Project. And when you and I first met almost 40 years ago and thinking about, it was just a dream. Uh, Three billion and 13 years later, it became a reality. But you and I have seen computers speed increase by a million fold. Data storage uh, costs dropping to a billionth of the cost. And things that we could have only dreamed about, even 25 years ago, become a reality. Uh, and then taking responsibility to run the largest research, bioscience research organization in the world also having to justify your budget on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. uh, with many of us here today in the room and around the world that might be watching this session on April 29th, 2019, <laughs> thankful for what you've accomplished. What excites you today in the world we live in and what can we count on at the National Institute of Health looking forward? Well, it is an absolute privilege to be on this panel uh, with these other distinguished people. And yes, Mike and I have known each other for quite some time. And every time we have this conversation, it evolves into new and exciting space that I'm not sure I would have even guessed a year or so ago uh, would be possible. 
I could wave my hands and talk about big things that are happening in biomedical research because there are a lot of them, but maybe I'll just pick a few examples and try to show with, through those examples just what kinds of things are now possible. In the basic science arena, maybe one of the real flagships that NIH is investing in now four years along is the BRAIN initiative. This effort basically aims to try to understand how those 86 billion neurons between your ears do what they do in real time and how that can be disrupted by the occurrence of illness. And goodness knows, we have lots of those illnesses we need to understand better, like Alzheimer's disease. The technology is pretty amazing. If you go to the next slide, basically, I want to, in a minute, ask them to run the audio on this. Let me tell you what the experiment is. We're trying to understand how the brain actually sends signals when you think about something. So individuals who have epilepsy sometimes come in for epilepsy surgery, where basically the brain has to be exposed as part of this. But they're often willing to take part in interesting experiments. So with many electrodes in the brain, this particular experiment asked those people to speak 0, 1, 2, 3, counting up from 0 to 9, and using a lot of artificial intelligence machine learning on several of these patients, interpreted those electrodes in terms of what information was being uh, sent out. And then they asked the people, don't say it, just think it, and let's see whether the machine learning can figure out what your brain is thinking. So let's hear what it sounds like. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Is that a little freaky? <laughs> but is that awesome? And imagine somebody who has lost their ability to speak. This is a step forward to figuring out how they could speak just by wow. thinking those words. That's just one of the things that's happening in this brain initiative. And again, the marriage here between uh, engineering, uh, electrophysiology, and artificial intelligence, I hope, comes across, because that's often where the excitement is now happening. When these disciplines bump into each other, the sparks fly. Sometimes they don't understand each other at first, but they figure it out, and then amazing things will happen. When it comes to therapeutics, I have to tell you how excited I am to see for those 7,000 genetic disorders where we now know the precise molecular cause, because we've been able to do with the advances in genomics that kind of diagnostic, only about 500 of them, though, have a therapy. We have a big gap there. That is starting to look like it's approachable, not in a one disease at a time fashion, but maybe in a scalable way using gene therapy. Let me tell you about an example. Uh, a disorder called spinal muscular atrophy is one of the most tragic conditions that I, as a geneticist, have the chance to see. Uh, these are children who are born, who appear normal at birth, but are a little floppy. And over the course of the next few months, they gradually lose their muscle tone. They have essentially the infantile version of ALS. And they have a genetic disorder that is now very well described, which will cause them to lose their lives by about one year of life, basically, of respiratory insufficiency. They suffocate. It's heartbreaking to watch this. We know the problem. So Jerry Mendel took the bold step of figuring out how to put into a vector, in this case, a virus called AAV9, a copy of the gene that these children are missing. Most people would never have imagined that that could actually work, that you could infuse this intravenously and it would end up getting to those motor neurons in the spinal cord, which are the things that you have to treat. But after some very elegant animal model experiments that look promising, he started this effort now in about a dozen kids, all of whom were diagnosed very early before they had lost a lot of motor milestones. And the remarkable output of this is that for those children that were, in fact, treated a single infusion, one time, in the first couple of months, uh, the results were pretty amazing. Let me show you an example of little Mateo. This is a boy who should not be here. Oh, that's mm. great. He's about two and a half. I think you'll have a hard time seeing that he has any motor deficiency at all. Yeah, push that button. <laughs> Up on his tiptoes. <laughs> and his experience there has been replicated many times. This is now an effort that's gone to Avexis, and from there to Novartis is currently being reviewed by FDA. Seema will say, how much does it cost? And this is a serious issue because in the first phase of these very high-tech enterprises, the costs do tend to be rather extreme. And 
Also, example of sickle cell disease, which has recently been featured in 60 Minutes, uh, if you saw that about a month ago, where we are now, for that first molecular disease, able to offer to individuals like Janelle Stevenson, who'd lived a life characterized by intense pain from these attacks uh, of sickle cell crises, now going through a gene therapy, and out the other side of this, now a year later, doing jujitsu and having had no pain uh, since that episode. And if you look at her blood smear, you would never say she had sickle cell disease anymore. She is probably cured. Again, the cost right now, we have to figure out how to scale this. But I hope you get the sense that this may be a way for those thousands of diseases to have a scalable approach where if we had the ability to do this kind of genetic therapy using such things as CRISPR-Cas and gene editing, uh, we could, in fact, begin to tackle those in our lifetime. And that would be an amazing gift for those 25 million people in the United States who suffer from rare diseases for whom otherwise it's not clear how we're getting to where they want us to be. So those are a couple of things, but we also were talking about the importance here of dealing with prevention. So what is NIH doing in that space? One last example I want to give you and maybe invite you to join if you haven't already. We need the largest data set you can imagine. If we're really going to go to precision health, as Mike was talking about and others have reflected on this as well, because we need a lot of individuals with a lot of data. That's what the All of Us Research Program is, which aims to enroll one million or more Americans in this and to ask them to donate everything about them, their electronic health records, blood samples and urine samples, complete genome sequences to be determined, all sorts of other lab tests, wearable sensors that they'll walk around with, answering lots of questionnaires about their lifestyle, their behavior, their diet, their exercise, and so on. And all of this data made available to any researcher who agrees not to try to identify who the individuals are, and they'll have the access to see what we could learn from this about how people stay healthy or how they fall ill and what we should be doing about it. We are going pretty fast on this. The launch was last May. We're coming up on the first anniversary of this. Uh, the slide will show you that, in fact, as of now, as of April 10th anyway, uh, we've enrolled 214,000. That's the largest cohort that NIH has put together in a long time, and that's just getting started. Uh, and 130,000 of them are all the way through this, have done all of the steps. If you want to join, joinallofus.org is right there. Feel free to come on board. Uh, we'll ask you for some things, and we will protect your identity, and we have a secure database from soup to nuts that is the best one can do, although one has to recognize that there are some risks here, and people should know about those before they join in. This is going to be transformative. These are going to be a million people who are pre-consented for taking part in other research projects, so all kinds of things can be layered on top of this, and it will be a group that has this legacy data already in hand. This is going to change the way we do a lot of clinical research. So there are just a few of the things we're doing. If Mike gave me another hour, I could give you another 25 examples, but I'd probably better stop because he's kind of giving me that look. <laughs> <laughs> so Francis, I'd like you, before we move on, 2011, we all went to Lake Tahoe to uh, discuss yes, we did. innovations. How do we innovate in medical research? And 70 to 80 of us, and we concluded at that retreat that we needed to focus on translational science mm -hmm. and the movement from the research translational to clinical. Um, shortly thereafter, NCATS was approved. And you had a lot to do with that. Mark. National Center for Advancing Translational Science, and Chris Austin was picked, and this should change Hopefully, every, the life for every single person on the planet, very few people know it. 2012, for the first time in history, to reaffirm our country's commitment to medical research and the rate of return, we had the celebration of science. Many of the people here with us seven years later were there to reaffirm what the importance was and the opportunities and why investments and why those countries that invest in bioscience will be the leaders in the 21st century. As I think about what our panel has discussed, Sue pointed out that she worked in a field where your patients were constantly dying. Just imagine the fortitude a physician has who's been trained to try to keep you alive in the 
inability to keep you alive. I know when we looked at childhood cancer in the 1970s, uh, we saw almost a 90% divorce rate of Memorial Sloan Kettering for people taking care of children uh, who had cancer. And if we looked at what occurred uh, in leukemia, it was almost nine months. <clears throat> That's all it took from the playground uh, to the cemetery. And the tremendous advancements that occur. Sue, I'd like to go to you. <clears throat> in, the, in 1900 in America, one in five Americans lost their life before the age of five. Major causes of death, tuberculosis, dysentery, pneumonia. Gates' mission today, we have solutions for these. Yet we still have, particularly in Africa and Sub-Sahara uh, and in South Asia and parts of Central America even, substantially higher death rates from the, what we know we could solve those problems. What is Gates' mission? What, what do you want to achieve in this area? Well, uh, let me pick up on some of the comments that have been made by uh, this amazing panel. Um, I think I was there in Tahoe when we talked about yes. translation and the dream that this revolution um, in our ability to be precise would make a difference for patients. And so I want to keep moving from what you talked about, uh, Mike, on the, the um, panel and the commission with Governor Brown. You moved from that kind of personalized feeling, one patient at a time, to precision health. Um, and I would push us to move to a lens of precision public health. Precision public health is a much more regional, community-based way of thinking about, for example, malaria eradication. Malaria eradication in Southeast Asia is fundamentally different than malaria eradication in Brazil. And that knowledge and that um, precision that we use um, partners like WHO, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, to literally map out those, in the case of polio, last vestiges of disease in Pakistan and Afghanistan, or in the case of malaria, where has the mosquito become resistant to the pesticide em embedded bed nets? Where do we need to get ahead of artemisinin resistance? So a much more precise way of thinking about controlling those diseases that shouldn't be affecting anyone today, but also adding an equity lens. And, and I think there's a couple of things that are implicit in some of the dialogue today that I want to bring out as explicit. We have to get these data in the hands of decision makers. On the front lines, community health care workers, ministers of health, those who are driving the health of their nations, um, prime ministers, the minister of finance needs to know their own data. So increasingly, data for decision making at the point of care is the revolution that we're all talking about. Um, often those data need to get and those smartphones need to get in the hands of women. And all too often, she doesn't have the control she needs to get her children vaccinated, to get access to, to antenatal <clears throat> care. So I think there's an equity lens on precision public health that makes a lot of sense, um, not just globally, but I mean, looking at the measles outbreak, that knowledge and that education for girls and mothers is so important for the world. But I want to point out another area of innovation that hasn't been raised yet, and it's something I'm really excited about at Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is probably something that people don't know about, and that is how we work with the private sector. So in the not-for-profit world, it is not uncommon that people put um, white hats and black hats <clears throat> on folks. If you work in the not-for-profit world, you get a white hat. And if you work in the not-for-profit uh, world, you must have a black hat. Well, um, obviously, having worked 16 years in pharma and biotech, I reject that black hat. <laughs> <laughs> but I reject it because I need, in solving the world's hardest problems, I'm completely with uh, Bill, Melinda, and Warren that we should access wherever there is talent, pace, and money. Wouldn't you want to bring talent, pace, and money to the world's hardest problems? I would. 
And so what we've done is we've put together um, different ways and innovations in how we address market failures. It's a market failure that, that companies aren't investing in antimicrobial resistance. It's a market failure that companies aren't motivated to work on tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we think about market failures? Well, one of the ways we do is we have a strategic investment fund. Um, and our strategic investment fund is $2 billion. $2 billion that's available for investments that we call program-related investments. So a program-related investment is an investment in a cause. Um, I'll give you an example of, of one of the investments we made. Um, so one of the areas of market failure I mentioned, tuberculosis. Another is um, neglected tropical diseases, filarial diseases, things that cause elephantiasis and other very debilitating diseases that differentially affect the poor. And so we found that some of the most interesting targets were at a small biotech company called Anacor that was using um, new boron-related chemistry. The details of the science are less important than the fact that we wanted them to work on filarial disease and tuberculosis. So we made a $5 million equity investment and did a grant, an $18 million grant, that had charitable clauses that said if you discover a new molecular entity for, for tuberculosis, for filarial disease, we want it to be affordable for the people we care about. That investment allowed their R&D to continue to prosper and make investments in boron-related chemistry. And all of that led to exciting new targets that are now in the translational work and to such a great return on investment for that company that Pfizer acquired them in 2016. Now, for our part, we took the returns and invested them right back into charity because we're not in the business of making money. We're in the business of solving diseases. But that's such a good example of where great science, great science for causes that, from a precision public health point of view, are affecting regions of the world that are underinvested, that we can use this financial innovation and this investment innovation to drive the kinds of outcomes that inspire us. I think if we uh, touch on that, Seema, the importance of you encouraging new technologies, new developments, we see in many areas today, and I know under Tunisia's leadership at Faster Cures, and Faster Cures, <clears throat> excuse me, 3.0, what we're seeing is she's been very focused on driving data in the world we live today, but making sure we have economic incentives, models that Sue's just talked about, so that people are focused on quite often, let's call it, um, diseases that might not be the focus uh, from that standpoint. And as a result, uh, who you reimburse, how you reimburse, whether you're reimbursing for prevention, uh, the idea that you're going to roll up that we're going to go to Kaiser and offer you so much to control a patient, which will ultimately reduce costs. Let's get back into the innovation. If we had 50 people here at the conference this year in 2019 that had innovative ideas. How do they interact with you? Well, that's one of the things that we're focusing on. <clears throat> the, the reality is a lot of times government policies and government regulations sort of stymie investment and progress. One example that we were dealing with just this past year was around diabetic pumps. Um, the private sector was paying for these pumps and when people would come into the Medicare program, we didn't cover it. And that's because the government policies, the way they're structured, you know, they're enshrined in law over many, many years. And so they say, we're going to pay for supplies or we're going to pay for um, durable medical equipment. And if you can't get your product to fit in one of these narrow <coughs> definitions, sometimes we're not paying for it. So not only are we not giving access to our beneficiaries, but we're sort of, we're stymieing um, I would say, um, innovative thought and innovative products that are coming to mind. One of the things that we're trying to work on is, especially with breakthrough technology, how do we get it so that it's right out of FDA and it doesn't take a very, very long process within the CMS process around not only how much we're going to pay for it, 
Um, coding, simple things of making sure there's a code available to bill for that. That can almost take a year. We only do that one time a year. Um, and then are we going to cover it? So what we're trying to work on at the agency is to try to improve those processes to make it go faster. The other thing that we need to be aware of is that um, are we paying for certain things in certain areas where we want to see innovation? Um, one area that we, we don't see a lot of um, innovative ideas and technology is in the area of kidney care. Um, we are the largest payer for end-stage renal disease. And just recently, we changed our policy so that we would pay more for innovative treatment. Um, another area where we haven't seen as much development as we would like would be in the area of antimicrobials. And it's because of the way Medicare pays for um, antibiotics delivered in the hospital. And it's essentially within what we call down in the weeds, you know, a lump sum payment that we pay for hospitals, to hospitals. So if a new product comes to market, they're gonna have to be paid inside that budget that we've established. And it's not worth it for folks to make those investments. So one of the things that we're thinking, you know, how do we change that? How do we make sure that our new technology payments that we do have are, are substantial enough to cover um, the cost of the innovative treatments? One area that we've been struggling with is in the area of CAR-T, you know, great potential for changing and pr uh, treatment for, how we to, for to cancer patients, improving outcomes. And this could really be a first-line treatment. And while it's very expensive, half a million dollars in some case, it could potentially be the first-line treatment and avoid a lot of costs. So we want, again, but the way our policies were set up is it took a long time to even provide um, coverage for this and to make sure that we were paying for it. And we weren't paying for it. And so what we found was that a lot of centers weren't offering the treatment because they would actually take a loss on the product. And so it's a great example of how when government policies are not aligned with what's going on in the market, you can actually stymie innovation. We're trying to change those things. We're trying to figure out how to work with the FDA to make things go faster so when a product is approved, we can immediately have coverage and payment and coding and that it's adequate enough to encourage the investment. And I think we also have to look at some of these ideas where we do want to see um, more innovative uh, treatments, especially for um, orphan diseases, and make sure that our policies are aligned. But unfortunately, government policies have not kept up. So <clears throat> let's go to you, Bernard. <clears throat> you have the largest foundation to your right who's funding medical research. You have the largest organization that's paying. <clears throat> and on the panel, you have the largest medical research, largest foundation, largest payer focused on technology, medical research. How can they help you deliver care? Mm -hmm. You're at ground zero here, mm -hmm. dealing with patients, thousands of them coming in every day. How can they help you? What do you want to see that would be helpful to you? Well, I mean, one of the competencies that we have in our organization, of course, is the ability to scale up. And it's right along the lines of what Sue was talking about in terms of how we think about not just our patients, but also the communities in which we exist. And so inside of Kaiser Permanente, we have what we call the 1366 line of view, and that is the 13, uh, technically almost 13 million members. Uh, we have 12.5 now. So we should be at 13. So I round up to 13. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then we exist in communities in which there are 66 million people. Because we think that, um, and you heard it earlier, that it is broader than healthcare. Mm -hmm. It's about the whole ecosystem of health. There are factors that affects a person's health much greater than, quote, medical care. Mm -hmm. And so the long-term view is to look at a whole ecosystem of how to think about um, food and uh, safe communities and um, the behaviors that we now exhibit that works against maximizing total health life years. And then the last area that I would touch on that came up earlier is the tremendous work that we have ahead of us on mental health and well-being. Um, this is an area where we have a lot of work to do 
and how really to help in both the prevention and the treatment of mental health disease and mental health illnesses and mental health challenges, which today is costing more than people can imagine. It's the number one reason for disability. Uh, suicide with young girls is the number one killer between the ages of 15 and 21, 22. <clears throat> number two for all young people between the ages of 16 and 26. Just some examples of the issues that we have going on with mental health and wellness. And so that's a whole area that we have to focus on. Well, with the expertise coming in and with our infrastructure and capabilities within Kaiser Permanente that's led from the medical side of it by you know, 24, 25,000 physicians in our Permanente medical groups, we can take that and then put it out there and both look at it from an evidence-based way actually in practice and then also study the costs and the benefits that comes along uh, with it. The fact that the industry is designed around managing uh, illnesses and we're now living in an era where we're talking about curative, we have to rethink the whole financial model mm -hmm. that matches our reality. Mm -hmm. And that's a big piece of work that we're looking at right now. How do you equate um, medication, for example, that's able to cure hepatitis C? Yes. What's the new calculation for the long-term benefit of this cure versus what we have built, which is the long-term expense for managing a disease? So I, I think this is really an enlightening point we should focus on. When we first put out a report in 2007 called An Unhealthy America. And looking at this one and a half trillion area cost of the change in weight, what really shocked me was the number one cost was not diabetes, was not cancer, was depression. Mm -hmm. And I think you've touched on one of the great challenges we have today. Uh, Francis, I'd like to go to you uh, on two areas besides for a response. One, based on current growth rates, China will have more people with diabetes and cancer than live in the United States. More people with diabetes and cancer than live in the United States. 300 million smokers. Uh, you didn't even study diabetes 30 years ago in China because no one had diabetes. Uh, but the dramatic changes that are occurring. I'd like you to touch base on the internationalization standpoint mm -hmm. of these efforts. Uh, obviously, Sue's and Gates focus is not just the United States, but the world. And what is the potential for cooperation? Why China and the United States are discussing trade. Obviously, there's a commonality of interest. Mm -hmm. Curing polio finding that solution with the leadership from Gates has spread to the entire world. Uh, is there a cooperative uh, from a financial standpoint and the loading of patients, et cetera, that's available to us that would spur science today? Absolutely, there is, and it needs to be just as strong as it possibly <clears throat> can if we care about the whole planet. Uh, we work closely with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. When you look at the investments in global health research, between Gates and NIH, you're talking about more than 50% of all of the dollars that go into global health research. We meet uh, every year uh, with Bill present, and we have a number of working groups that work on this together. Most of that focused on low and middle income countries. <clears throat> but you ask about China. Uh, another organization worth mentioning is the Global Alliance for Chronic Disease, GACD, which is a spin-off of a group of the major funders of research across the world called HEROES, the Heads of International Research Organizations. We will host that meeting in about six weeks at, at NIH. Mm -hmm. Around that table will be about 95% of the funding for <coughs> biomedical research in the world because all of the countries send their CEOs, no staff, it's Chatham House rules, and we get a lot done. And the Global Alliance for Chronic Disease is a spinoff from that. And they have now done projects including China, on diabetes, on hypertension, a big potential area of opportunity 
uh, on environmental lung disease and now on mental health. And I could not agree more with Bernard that this is an area of desperate need and where we desperately need new scientific insights into what we could do that would be more effective, although ketamine is a, a bit of a bright spot in what otherwise has been a pretty uh, dismal kind of series of steps in making advances. So yeah, we are integrated, we're connected, we are doing everything we can to find every partner we can. And again, NIH is deeply engaged with industry as well in partnerships in pre-competitive space. Just like uh, was said earlier, why would you not want to do that if that could advance the cause of public health? So one, uh, one more statement by each of our panelists today. If we asked them and we convened here in three years in 2022, and we said this has been the most successful period of time in making healthcare affordable in the United States, of solving worldwide problems. What are the elements? We have a lot of people that would like to help each of you. What are the key elements, Sue, if we were here in three years that you told me it was the three most successful years of what you achieved? What, is, what would have happened in those three years? I would love to see um, the political discourse, the, the civil society discourse, over-focused on health and education um, for those in the community who feel left behind. Um, and so I think that three years from now, I would love for anyone running for office, putting forward a policy, has to ask and answer the question about access for a broader group of people, um, women, people of color, to the kind of education and health that leaves people as inspired about the future as I am today. I think one of the things uh, we should emphasize um, in mentioning this is as we look at this measles outbreak in the United States, etc., we understand that Total health is not related just to what you do, but what your community does around you and what anyone is doing anywhere in the world. Bernard, if you told me all your dreams had come true at Kaiser <laughs> and it was three years from now, what happened? <laughs> uh, so, mu so much, but, um, and I think that would be a big part of it, that there would be a stage full of people all contributing to a healthy life. And you have the option of calling on anyone from the local grocery store manager to the president of the school district to the minister in the community. Uh, and you can ask them a question about how now is the infrastructure different to create a healthy environment. But the second part that would really catch your attention, my attention, <clears throat> I had uh, about six families that met with me last week. Uh, each of them had a daughter or a son that committed suicide. And they wanted to tell me what the experience was like uh, leading up to the, in most cases, the child's death. I'll never forget that meeting. Mm. Three years from now, uh, one of the families will be sitting here and they would tell us, we turned the corner in honor of my daughter. Mm. And I'm thinking about somebody in particular. Mm. And that even though I suffered this with my child, I now see a path forward to catch early signs of when something is really, really going wrong, mm. that somebody is willing to take their life. Mm. Mm. I think uh, we all want to make your wish come true. And I think, Bernard, one of the things uh, today you pointed out, in the United States, whereas you might be taking care of approximately 13 million lives, one in five Americans lives in a Kaiser community today. And I think you've stressed the point that health, wellness is a community effort, uh, not a one-on-one. -on -one. Seema, <clears throat> what Three years from now, what you have told me that these were exciting years and productive years uh, for CMS and your ability really to change the world for everyone 
with your decisions. A little bit of pressure there. So I think that one of the things that I think about every single day is how do we sustain our programs? How do we make healthcare more affordable? Our actuaries tell us that by 2027, which is right around the corner, we'll be spending one in every $5 on healthcare. And the reality is all the changes that we've made through regulations and changes to the law over the last 10, 20 years has done nothing, absolutely nothing to change the rate of growth of healthcare in our nation. And so collectively, all the things that we're doing, whether it's focusing on research and innovation, mental health, infectious diseases, <clears throat> I hope that collectively we start to change that paradigm. I think we need to move a lot faster towards payment reform, but ultimately the measure of success will be have we changed the, road of, the rate of growth so that healthcare is more affordable and accessible to the entire population. Can a government agency, many people say, you know, a government agency cannot move as fast, as quickly, maybe can't recruit the same talent as a private industry can, or maybe even as a philanthropic organization can. How do you respond to that? I think that's true. I've worked on both sides. I've worked on the private sector, and I'm now working in the public sector. We have an amazing, talented group of individuals that are working at CMS that are hardworking and dedicated to the health of the American people. That being said, we are often stymied by government regulations. It takes an act of Congress to make even small and routine changes. Um, I think that we have to partner with the private sector and we have to make sure that there is always a role for the private sector because that's where a lot of innovation comes from. And from being in government, we often borrow and partner with the private sector. And I think in this country, we must always have a pathway for, we must always support private sector innovation. So I, in closing here, Sue set up, a, they have a strategic investment fund inside Gates today to push science. The CIA, the Department of Defense have DARPA and other technologies that they're allowed to invest in. Does CMS have that option today? We have a lot of, you know, little things that we can do here and here, and trust me, we're focusing on how we can make changes to our regulations to encourage innovation. By paying more in certain areas, we just put out a proposal to be able to pay more for breakthrough technology to encourage investment. That being said, a lot of what we do at the agency does depend on an act of Congress which is why I think investing too much in government and depending too much on government for innovation and driving us forward um, would be a problem for our country. Francis, in closing, I'd just like to give you one word, Alzheimer's. The results are devastating. We and the world have aging populations today. We're concerned that the cost of this disease as the world ages is gonna change. What can we count on at the NIH and how, in a call to action to investors, patients, medical research groups, technology firms today, what would accelerate our solutions and get this disease under control? How can we help you? Well, I was going to go there too if you're going to ask me to imagine where we might be able to be in 2022. I would hope this stage would in fact be occupied by people younger than us and who would be uh, the next generation of early stage investigators who had made the latest breakthroughs. And that might be in areas involving artificial intelligence applications to precision medicine, but I would really want one of those people to be talking about how they had discovered a way to delay or maybe even prevent altogether Alzheimer's disease. I am actually somewhat optimistic that can happen, even despite the failure of the recent trials using amyloid monoclonals, which have happened over and over again and make us all pretty discouraged. But we should not be so discouraged when you consider 
the plethora of new insights into the other things that are going on in an Alzheimer's brain, including inflammatory responses, the immune system's in there somewhere, lipids, something about cell processing, the glial cells. We have a lot more clues than we did five years ago, and many of those are already now finding their way into clinical trials. So watch this space. It's no time to be despondent. But boy, do we have to have all hands on deck. And that means working with industry as we are in the Accelerating Medicines Partnership, which has done a lot of things that we could not have done ourselves and they couldn't either. That means working across boundaries with other countries, which is going, I think, pretty well in this space. But let's admit, this is really hard. That doesn't mean we're not going to find the answers. We will. 2022, I think there's a good chance we would not be sitting here saying, well, we still don't know what's going on. Give us three years along with a few other things that'll happen in those three years. Final thing I would say is, I think the thing we ought to really focus on that covers all of this is this culture of boldness, which is emerging now, I think, in biomedical research in all the sectors and the ecosystem that we're part of. And that means recruiting people from different areas of expertise, and particularly for NIH, that's gonna be in the artificial intelligence place. That's probably the place we most need to invest in. But it's also diversity. We need more women, especially in senior leadership roles. We need diversity of perspectives. We have to deal with this vexing problem of sexual harassment and wipe that out because that has been discouraging women from staying in our workforce and we have to take care of that. But when you put all that together, we are an amazing time, scientifically, in terms of resources and in terms of needs. And it's a privilege, I think, for all of us who get to be involved in that to wake up every morning and say, this is the moment, this is a noble enterprise, we get to be part of that. Well, thank you, and I wanna thank you for joining us today, and, and those that are watching us online someplace in the world, or those that came today, we, want, we can't thank these four panelists enough. Sue, whose career has touched many areas, leader in biotech research, leading one of the medical, leading medical institutions, academic institutions in the world, taking up the challenge as the world's largest foundation in this area and applying all of her talents. Bernard, whose compassion, humanity, uh, leads one of the most important organizations in the world in taking care of people. Sema, as the world's largest organization, uh, understanding the importance of partnerships, but understanding the importance of getting data into patients' hands and moving into AI and other forms will change the world for us if she succeeds. And Francis as leading the world's largest medical research institution and having the exact same enthusiasm today as when we got together decades ago. Thank you for joining us today. <laughs>